The Mac Geek Gab, 697 for the 19th of February, 2018. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab here, where we get together to share your questions, to share your tips, to share your cool stuff found, answer your questions. The goal being every single one of us leaves having learned at least five new things each and every time you get together. We get together. Sponsors for this episode include... Jamf now. We're at Jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G. You can get your first three devices free for life. And also RoboForm, where using coupon code M-G-G, you can save 10 bucks off your RoboForm subscription. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in formerly chilly, but now warming up, Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Ron. And here, another part of Durham, New Hampshire, is... Uh, that guy that opened the show, Pilot Pete. How you doing, Thanks Pilot Pete? Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you made it, man. Yeah, glad to be with you. This yeah. is fun. I cool. always like coming here. And uh, just so everybody knows, like, hey, I told Dave today I was coming over and good to do, good to go. And he says, yeah, I moved the studio around a little bit, and uh, but I'll get you all set up. And I got over here and everything was set up. The cans were here, the uh, mic stands all set up and no microphone. I think he was trying to tell me something. I so, think so. so. <laughs> yeah. And by, by the way, that's like now. Shut that's up. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. No, thanks for having me. I always yeah. have fun coming in and uh, yeah. spending this time with you guys. Cool. Well, thanks for flying in, Pete. There you go. Let's um, mm-hmm. let's jump to. Let's, well, we've got a bunch of tips, so let's just go right in and, and do some quick tips here and see. See how we do. Uh, we'll start with Patrick. He says. Uh, on Mac OS 10.13, hi, hi, Sierra, when deleting messages, click the X and it asks you repeatedly if you want to delete a message. Click the X while holding down option and it doesn't ask you much faster. I like that tip. I don't I don't wind up deleting messages often, but I've seen people do it. And so I know this is a thing that people do. And uh <laughs> Holding down the option key skips that confirmation dialogue. That's, that's nice. That's cool. That, and that's not rare, right? Or that's yeah. not unique to just messages. The option key can uh, skip confirmation dialogues and a lot of things. Yeah. And you know, I, and I'm a I huge think- keyboard user as opposed to, to mouse clicks and all that kind of stuff. Obviously speeds things up. The one that drives me nuts about messages, if, if you click the X and the dialogue comes up and you hit enter, the default is canceled. Correct. <laughs> it's of not course. yes. The default is non-destructive, <laughs> Pete. That's a good thing, though, well, right? It is, but so many times it is. The default is there. You just want to hit enter and move yeah. along, but not this time. So that's cool. That, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that one, Patrick. Anything on I that, John? There was a, I Go thought ahead. there was a similar one in the Finder. If you try to empty the trash, normally, like ah, many dialogues. Option says, well, are you- empty trash will, uh, will force okay. the emptying of the trash. If there's something in it that's locked, it will attempt to blow it away even though it's locked yeah, yeah. And, it, and you don't okay. get a dialogue once as you said that right. i just tried it don't get a dialogue right, there you go yeah yeah cool hey um so i don't know if this was intentional pete or if it was just the way you kind of read the script for today but when you introduced the show you said <laughs> mac geek gap you said the mac geek gap actually oh, as I opposed to the mac observer the mac observers mac, mac geek gap now right. we're not changing Why? anything Why? about the the branding of the show but as listener Barry noted, and we posted on Twitter this week, we did change the way the title of our show appears in our RSS feed, which impacts how it appears in every podcatcher out there, because the title used to say, and for 13, almost 13 years said the Mac observers, Mac geek gab enhanced, right? If you're in iTunes, cause you get the AAC version. We dropped the Mac observers from that. See, Dave, I'm psychotic. I knew you were going to do that. Yep. And that's how, yeah. Well, the reason we did it is we had several people saying, gosh, you know, I'm having a really hard time getting my voice assistant to play your podcast because uh, they think of this and understand. I mean, correctly, you, you think of this show as, you know, Mac Geek Gab. So you would say, you know, hey, a lady or hey, S lady play Mac Geek Gab. And it would say, I can't. And so instead you'd have to say, Hey, lady, play the Mac observers, Mac Geek Gab, which is not how you would think about it. 
And so it, I'd been thinking about changing the name on this for probably five years because it's just really long. Uh, so that was enough. Tip the scales. We did it. Barry said, uh, I read your tweet about the name change and just on a whim asked a lady play Mac Geek Gab podcast. To my surprise, the reply was getting the latest episode of Mac Geek Gab from TuneIn Radio. I'm sure I'm not the only one who didn't realize this function. That's pretty cool. I didn't. I actually yeah. had no idea that you could do that with Alexa. I've had, well, you Ooh. said it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, know, I, you can I, say it occasionally. Um, I I feel like, and I should do this too, that every podcaster should have uh, all of those devices in the studio in which they podcast actively oh. listening. Here you go. And that would curb any desire to say that word accidentally. Or you, or you could do this. Hey, Alexa, go rate Mac Geek Gap five stars now. <laughs> hey, I think it worked. <laughs> I think it worked. There you go. So, well, Dave, what, no, what they really should do, with we being kind of technical geeks and, and you being a, a audio geek, um, shouldn't they, and I, I thought we talked about this, but couldn't you put like a, a non- here uh, some sort of tag within the audio so that when it was and i i thought we amazon does that lit. with their commercials i know that so they that when they say the name it okay. doesn't go to the listening so there's some way to do it i just don't know what it is yeah I, we I, know it. I actually tried it somebody yeah. on reddit years ago not that long ago maybe last year had figured out that what they do is notch out uh, a big chunk of the mid-range frequencies kind of like the low mids they drop them by like 20 db and when the devices uh, the the a lady devices or or a word devices hear it with that notched out they know not to respond we tried that on the show the problem is we're doing all kinds of multi-band compression and everything uh to to make it so that no matter where you play this the audio is punchy and present and can be like over road noise without being too loud and so the EQ is way different between what I set here and what you even hear on the live stream at MacGeekGab.com slash stream, let alone what you get, which goes through another level of processing before it actually goes out on the podcast feed. So it, it didn't work for us, but uh, but I have no reason to believe it wouldn't if we turned off all our other filters. So there you go. So there you go. Yeah. Well, cool. the other problem is you got so many times said throughout the show. You know, trying to go through and tag it each time would drive you. It would drive you crazy. Quano. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. Uh, a quick tip that I stumbled on this week. I like to sign and when possible encrypt my emails uh, with Apple's mail app. And so not only do I use the sort of built in support for S mime certificates, I also use the, uh, the freely available, at least currently freely available GPG tools um, which allows me to have PGP as part of my signatures and on my, I'm going to have to ask you to make your typing quieter. Sorry. I can hear it coming through our ears. Really? It's wow. Okay. Well, really? cause your mic is not aimed away from you. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but, uh, where was I here? So, uh, after I, sorry about that, Pete. Um, no worries. When I installed GPG tools on one of my machines, I realized that it was defaulting to signing messages with that, not defaulting to SMIME, which is what I wanted. But I had one Mac that was defaulting to SMIME and one that was defaulting to GPG tools. And so I, I searched and I realized that there's a terminal command that you can type uh, yes. to tell your computer which one – really, you're telling the GPG tools plugin which one to to default to. And it, it, For it, GPG – GPG mail to be specific. Right. We're going to go down this rat hole. The plugin. So, so there's right. a mail plugin. Yep. But um, yes. Yeah, it's part oh, of GPG sorry. tools. And it's just a default right command. At, at, I, I'm not going to say it here. I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, but you're changing the default security mes method from number one to number two. And then it works exactly as I wanted. So I just wanted to share that that's possible. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Uh, if it does, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And you'll be saying, oh, thank goodness. So there you go. And, and all along those lines, John, you found something. Well, we, were, well, we ran into another thing. So we we, we were having a, an exchange, uh, email exchange with uh, our friend Kenny, um, uh, Kenny Lee, and he's in the chat room. Hi, Kenny. But um, but, so if you do get a GPG message, here's what you and I noticed, Dave, and and we had to take some action here. 
So when you receive an encrypted or signed message, Apple Mail will indicate that um, using whatever plugin. Um, the thing is, what you and I were noticing, Dave, is that we were getting email from Kenny, and at least I noticed, when I double-clicked on the signature icon in Mail, it said, well, this signature is not to be trusted. And it's like, well, that's not right. I mean, I trust Kenny. And it, <laughs> Here's why that was happening, though, Dave, um, very quickly. So normally, um, with the whole certificate dance that you do, the thing is, something has to be signed in order for it to be trusted. Um, hopefully, I, th that's enough of a condensation of the concept, Dave. Yeah. The thing is, with S-MIME, the certificates are signed by a CA who issues the certificate, and they're in your keychain. The thing is, PGP has a different model and that you have to do that operation manually. The thing is, if you don't sign the certificate of someone who emails you, it'll come up with this warning, and they admit that it's not a very good error message. The thing is, you have to sign their key to say that you GPG trust it. In order to say somebody trusts it. The thing is, with S-MIME, it happens because their certificate, their public certificate is in your keychain, but that PGP is a different model. Oh, that's right. You're making your own key, so it could be from anyone. Ah, I get it. Yeah. Okay. So right. somebody has and to have said they trust it. That makes sense. The thing is, uh, and they admit the error message is bad because it it's just saying nobody signed this. It's not saying that the signature or crypto is wrong because you see the message. It's right. just warning you something's not, you, you may want to kick it up a notch. In the early so, um, days of PGP, I remember people used to have key signing parties where you'd all get together and sign each other's keys after meeting one another and trusting that the person that you met that's showing you their key is in fact that person. And then, then you'd start to quickly build up, you know, a, a, a significant amount of trust in your keys. And that was kind of a thing, but that doesn't right. seem to happen. And the other thing is anymore. Kenny and I actually went through this, the other aspect of this for, for people that use PGP or GPG or both or neither. No, both. <laughs> um, Sometimes the keys in your key, GPG keychain may be stale. And that was another thing. So what I had to do was both sign uh, Kenny's key and also update. And, and we both had to do that. So I think the other aspect of this day we should talk about is that sometimes keys expire. And then when they expire, that's another thing that causes this error to come yep. up. Yep. You've got to keep your keys fresh. The nice thing with, with PGP keys is you can just, it, assuming you have the private key that goes along with it, you can just change your expiration date at will, which is great. Right. Do, do you have a good lo location for a tutorial for getting your key set up? Because I had mine up set up years ago. It was working great. I was doing it with yeah. you guys. And yeah. then my key expired and I tried to mess with it and uh, and then I ran out of time. And Yeah. Go to um, gpgtools.com. I want to say maybe? that it is. Org. I think it's You're right. Yeah. Dot com is the wrong place to go. Yeah. yeah GPGtools.org. Thank you. Okay. Yep. It, just go there and download GPG suite for the Mac. And that's what you want. Okay. That, that cool. will, that will take care of that All the process. certificates. And, yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yep. Yeah. Cause it'll let you create your own and then you, it'll put it in the thing and you can choose to publish it to the MIT key server. Or right. Actually one of many. Key yeah, right, right. Yep. So cool. Uh, from Kevin uh, in show 695, we, answered a question from James about using a Thunderbolt SSD as the main drive for an iMac. Uh, Ke Kevin says as a directly related issue in late January, I did a computer upgrade that your listeners might be interested in. He said a family member had a tw has a 27 inch uh, 2011 iMac. He had done a nuke and pave on it for them in 2013. In the years since they kept upgrading to the newest Mac OS all the way up to Sierra he says, I noticed during the Christmas holidays that it was getting long in the tooth. The two terabyte rotational internal drive was continuously banging away under constant siege by Sierra. Uh, he says, I watched the install a new hard drive video on OWC's website and decided that's not for me. He says, but the 2011 iMac was the last iMac to not have USB three. I have one right in front of me. I, yes, it, that is true. He says, but it did have and does have Thunderbolt one. He says, so I searched around and found a Thunderbolt G mobile one terabyte external drive from G technologies. Uh, he says um, he put a Samsung 850 Evo SSD in it. And uh, then he says, after installing new Ram and cleaning the iMac, he says, we got some Velcro command strips and attached the G drive to the back of the iMac stand. So it is totally out of sight and out of danger of accidentally being unplugged. 
and it plugged it into the new Thunderbolt one port. And now that's the boot drive and no one is the wiser. And everybody's happier, of course, because now they're running on an SSD. So if taking apart an iMac is not for you and you want to upgrade that way, um, Kevin points out just how simple that can be. So thanks, man. That's a good one. I like it. Good, John. Moving on. Is that a three-inch drive in those iMacs? Inside the iMac? Yeah. No, it's a no. full-size drive. It's only three-inch as opposed to the two and a half. In the, yeah, in yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. a full-size. Full-size full internal. Yeah, yeah. Full-size internal. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, but John. Yeah, it's good. You yep. just need the juice. You need the juice. That's it. Uh, if we found, we heard about another APFS bug this this week. APFS created, uh, if you create a disk image formatted APFS, then there is a bug in High Sierra that may or may not have been fixed with the update that came out earlier today uh, that can cause data loss on those disk images. So when you're making a disk image, format it HFS plus, and you'll be fine. You can create a disk image of any format you want on any drive you want. That's sort of the, the beauty and the point of disk images. So just don't make them APFS and don't format them that way. And I really think that this, you know, keeps coming back to the, the advice that I'll give and uh, John, you may disagree with me, but um, my advice is only use APFS on SSDs. Like do don't get creative. Don't try it on spindles. We've seen problems. Don't try it with disc images. We've seen problems. Don't try it with fusion drives. Who knows what would happen, right? APFS is a very young file system and it's been fairly reliable on SSDs. We're, we we are hearing though of some problems of data loss there too, um, not not anything systemic. But if if a problem happens, the repair utilities are not robust yet because they just haven't had enough experience. So it's like make sure everything's backed up is really the lesson there. Because if if the file system gets corrupted for whatever reason, which is going to happen on any drive, the repair utilities are not nearly as robust as they are for hfs plus so there you go yes and to follow up quickly yeah so i had an interaction with prosoft i told you i was going to write them about the these errors and stuff like that yeah. and uh, admittedly I, I wrote an email to their support and i was being a jerk because <laughs> i'm like why doesn't utility work you know. sure and then i thought about it and you you coached me and you were like dude it's not their fault and i'm like yeah you're right so i wrote back and i said sorry i was being a jerk and uh you know uh, it, here's some additional information that I got uh, from running FSCK underscore APFS, which uh, gives a little more detail when it, it claims that an APFS drive is uh, is faulty. The the error was IO error, which is like, yeah, that that's really useful. It doesn't work. Thanks. Right. <laughs> but Un- then I wrote back unexpected and unexpected result. And the, yeah. And the thing is, then that they wrote back saying, "Well, sorry, it didn't sound like we were trying to do anything about the problem." The thing is, we're as frustrated as you are, and that, the, the, like you said, Dave, it's relatively new. So, uh, but yeah, so their advice is don't do that. Uh, don't use APFS with a rotational drive. It's just their advice right now. Yeah, um, they still identify. And then you know, I had it. I reformatted, and it came up again, saying, "Well, you know, I'm, I'm something's wrong with this backup." Um, so that's all I'll say. They were they're very cool about it. They're just like, yeah, just don't do that because it's it, it's new. So I think yeah. our our advice all around is APFS is not ready for rotational drives at this point. There's or anything that that's not on. an SSD. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I think that's 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 the safest advice I can give right now. And frankly, the advice that I'm following here, especially after mm-hmm. what you went through on behalf of uh, sort of taking one for the team there. So mm-hmm. cool. Um, all right, let's, uh, we'll try something a little bit geeky here because I, I always like to get things right, even when we get things wrong. So we talked about men- memory <laughs> interleaving in a recent show and, uh, and we got it wrong. Bob r- wrote in such a great explanation of why memory interleaving might make things faster for you that I wanted to read it. Bob says, uh, memory interleaving does not increase the data bus width. With current memory technology, memory reads are destructive. 
Breeding a memory cell drains the capacitive charge to sense if a one or zero was stored. After figuring out what used to be stored in the memory address, the DIM needs to put the original value back. So you have one memory cycle to read the value and a second memory cycle to restore the original value. Until the read-write cycle completes, the DIM is not available for a new read. By interleaving, if the CPU is requesting data in sequence, the next read can be sent to the interleave DIM, which is not doing anything at the moment, and can immediately satisfy the read request. So you, while you've got, uh, actually he says it, but you know, while you've got one DIM sort of recovering from the read, instead of the CPU having to wait, it can go and read the next bit of data from the other interleave DIM. And by going back and forth like this, things can be much more efficient. Double, in fact, if it were that simple. He says, um, of course, since RAM stands for random access memory, not all access is sequential. So RAM access is not on average twice as fast, although the CPU and the CPU caches are way faster than your DIMMs. So even if all memory access was se sequential, the CPU would still be spending a lot of time waiting. Um, so there you go. That's uh, that makes perfect sense. Thank you so much, Bob, which is now why there's like a number thrown out that says it's about 15 percent faster. And I think that's just the real world yes. tests that that kind of sift out from from how this works. So thanks, Bob. Very cool. I love I okay. love this kind of stuff. Yeah. And that, that kind of proves quantum physics exists, right? Merely observing something changes it. Uh, you know, that, that's actually really interesting. Wow. Wait, isn't there something about a? Isn't there something about a cat involved with that? No, that, right? um, no. Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, well, that's Schrodinger's, 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 cat. Schrodinger's cat was killed by Occam's razor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh no! That's what we do here: proving quantum <laughs> physics exists. That's what we're that's going after here. I, Pete, that was just saying. I, I can't. Like, I like yeah, it. Okay. I like it. Do we just play the outro music now and that's the there end of it? Mic we're done. Yeah, we're done. Yeah, mic drop. We've got exactly. a lot more work. Please here. don't drop that mic. Um, okay. That's an expensive mic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you didn't want me to have it in the first place. Now I know why. Well, yeah, what we, that's what right. Mic is, what, what, what you Pete mean? is on a Heil PR20. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's what he's on. That's Making the low end. sound dulcet and smooth. Yeah. It actually <laughs> works really well for Pete's voice. It's, it's, it, and you're uh, on the, the PR40. I'm on a 40. Yeah. But, you know, the 40, the problem is you got to roll off lots of low end. Otherwise, it, it gets, uh, it gets you know, a little boomy. But um, but it's not a nice big uh, my, nice big diaphragm on it, which is okay. Nice life easy. Well, we'll, so. we'll discuss what yeah. I'm doing here in a moment. Hmm. All right, so uh, so John, you got some new toys, though. Yes, I did. So you know, um, I don't know if it was just that you know I got my Apple dividend, or uh, or just because I I wanted to stimulate the economy. Sure. But, so Dave, I dropped. Uh, I I decided, you know, I got to get this iPhone Seven upgraded to something, something newer. Sure. So as you recall, I dropped it, so the screen was cracked. It was in a non-visible portion, so it was perfectly functional, but uh, Verizon. It's kind of picky in that they're like, well, if the screen's cracked, they have three conditions if you want to trade in a phone. One, no cracks on the screen. Number sure. two, the battery isn't a piece of garbage. And I forget there was like a third one. But okay. anyways, the screen was cracked. So I'm like, you know what? Let me go. So I set up a, a an appointment with the Genius Bar yep. um, at the Trouble Mall yep. uh, and said, you know, I want a same day replacement of my screen. Uh, the current price for that is $149. And I'm like, well, I got to pay this if I want to trade my phone in and upgrade. And they were totally cool about it. I think it took them about an hour, 15 minutes instead of an hour, but they did it within an hour in real time. And, you know, I got to hang out at the mall and, you know, have some sushi and all that sure. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but then as I was walking around the mall, I'm like, oh, look, there's a Verizon store here. Uh -oh. It's not my local one. And I'm like, so I walk in there and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm getting my phone fixed. And I'm like, uh, do you happen to have an iPhone 8, 256 gig space gray in stock? And they're like, yeah, hold on. And they're like, yes, we do. And I'm like, might as well do it all here. <laughs> so you paid to get your phone repaired and then you walked across the hall and traded it in to get it or downstairs phone. Yeah, and yeah. traded it in and then upgraded. So Verizon allows you to, if you're at least a year into your contract to upgrade and then basically resume. Yeah, depending on, on which, which, which payment plan you're on. Like there are some that you have to wait longer than a year, but, but yes, the but, one that I'm on right, is yeah. at, as long as you're at least a year into your 
planned for the current phone, you can upgrade to the newer phone right. and uh, they'll accept the trade in and then, you know, start a new plan and everything works swimmingly. It was a, uh, no, they're awesome. Didn't you have, you know, didn't have to switch the, the SIM or anything like that. It just migrated from one phone to the other and like, yep, thanks for the old phone and here's your new mm-hmm. phone. And I got to say, the thing is, Dave, you know, at first I was like, should I upgrade? I mean, the thing is the eight, uh, you know, I've only had it for a couple of days, but the thing is it's, it's not a, uh, mind blowing upgrade experience, but it's better in subtle ways. The the reason I think I went with this is number one, I'm still kind of wary of the face ID. And number two, the size of this phone is the same as the seven, so all my cases and accessories hope work. Sure. Yeah, it really is kind of like the seven S, right? Like you exactly. said, you yes. get a you get a, a a incremental update of some things. You get uh, wireless charging capability, even though th- there's no wireless charger included with the with the phone, you could certainly right. do that. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's just a little faster, better camera. Did you? Well, did yeah. you go eight or eight plus? No, so I got the eight, but okay. I did get so my old my seven was one twenty eight gigs, and this one I think the choices are sixty four and two fifty six. So I'm like, well, I might as well get to two fifty six. Yeah, it's sixty four so, is so much nicer. Yes. Yeah, yes. especially since I went to iCloud Photo Library, right. uh, in which case, you know, I want that extra space. So I'm um, very happy with the experience. Verizon is awesome, allowing you to, uh, you know, give them more money. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then, Dave, over the weekend, I'm like, you know, I want to check out the Qi, right? Even though yeah. it's spelled Q-I, it's pronounced Qi. I'm like, well, now I got the wireless charging. Totally. So I ordered on Saturday, Dave. Um, so I looked around and Wirecutter had a Samsung charger. Um, and Amazon also has it as like a, a best choice, and it's in our show notes here. Fifteen bucks. It doesn't do the fast charge, but it works fine with the iPhone eight. It was just awesome. Just put it down. Well, and it's charging. The, the iPhones won't do fast charge, right? Yeah. They they will I do. I think we have to wait until their pad comes out because this pad does have fast charge, but it only is fast charge with Samsung, Samsung phones. Yeah, yeah the, the iPhone. iPhone's fast charge is going to be faster obviously than the the standard but not quite as fast as what actual chi fast charging is it's apple morphing right. the standard for their own benefits but, but the thing is yeah. i tried this charger so i got it today because usps delivers on sure. holidays which today is a federal holiday but they deliver which is awesome so i got it within two days and uh it's 15 bucks you know it charges i think i measured uh in the course of 15 minutes and increase the charge by 10%. So not as fast as USB, but still it's convenient. And I got two of them, one for upstairs, one for downstairs. Nice. And when you come over next day, Oh, I can just lay my phone on the Mm. pad. Uh What's really nice is how many charge through the case, how many cases it'll charge through as well too. Some cases won't obviously, but yeah. Yeah. As long as you don't have a big hunk of metal in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is that's why the back of the eight is glass and not aluminum. Be careful with that glass back. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I put, you know, the thing is, this is that I had the OtterBox, um, and yet you managed to break the screen anyway. Modular. (laughs) No, I have, I had the OtterBox modular case, which allows you to plug in peripherals and stuff like that. The, uh, universe, I think, right. OtterBox universe. I think that's the name. Yeah. Yeah. I'll look it up. But, um, the problem is, is that the, uh, to accommodate plugging in peripherals, uh, the underside is unprotected. And guess where I dropped it when I fumbled it in a parking lot, which on the underside. Now what I have on it now is a spec case, which a lot of their cases, they actually advertise. So right now I have the clear one. They also have colored ones. I like the clear one because you can see the, you yeah. know, the phone. But cool. um, I put that one on because they actually advertise a certain level of resistance. To yeah, no, the spec the stuff is is very drop proof. Yeah. Spec stuff All right, we'll make sure to put that in the um, in the show notes, too. Oh, that case? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we've done it before. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that the Presidio Clear, or whatever it is? I Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll take care um, of it then. All right, and... Um, and you have one more, should... right? Well, I don't, I don't know if I should... I don't know if I, I want to mention it. Okay, well, then we'll skip it. <laughs> well, I could. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I was hoping that you'd hear it, but... Um, I can't decide for you, so... Yeah. Have you have you ever heard of the Shure 55 SH Series 2 dynamic microphone, otherwise known as the Elvis microphone? Thank you very much. The Shure, which one? Say it again. 50, 55, 55 SH. SH. Yeah. 
Well, I'll send you a link here. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about it before. It's the one that that looks like it has a very classic look on the stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that's the third toy that I bought, and I'm talking on it right now. Okay. That makes. It, I thought something had changed dramatically in my audio setup here. Okay. Because it like I wasn't getting the same type. Like I was getting weird like uh articulation noises out of your mouth that I've never heard before. Yeah. Okay. I thought I thought it was my ears on these meds or maybe the change in the setup of the studio here having Pete's mic open. I couldn't figure out what it was. It was kind of driving me crazy. So Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. I, I like it if you want Don't me to mess with me like that. <laughs> Dave, you should just go. But I just like, like it because it's, it's a simpler. cool look. It's a cool looking mic. And I've just been seeing it more and more in music videos that I've been watching. And I'm like, and that's a cool looking mic. So um, but we'll discuss. I, I, I just like it because it looks cool. But uh, you know, yeah. We'll Are you so. talking directly into it? No, I'm doing like you recommend, side, like with the, with the PR4. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah I'm, not, I'm not screaming right into it. it. It's on the side here, so huh. I don't get the poop. Yeah, I'm just getting like, right. It, there, there's a lot less of that. The, like I said, that boominess that I need to sort of tune out of the PR40 is um, is not there. But there's a weird like like maybe six kilohertz thing that's very, very boosted on that mic. So that's what, and that's what we're hearing. In fact, people in the chat room are saying, yeah, I'm noticing something with John's mouth. So there you go. So there you go. Uh, His lips are moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not really a broadcast microphone, right? And it may not be. So we'll, uh, we'll yeah. work with it, but yeah, yeah. again, it's, it's fine. Just like, I like yeah. the look of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. They do no. mention that this mic has a character. Uh, yeah. They do mention the, the sure boost somewhere. And yeah. yeah, it does have a different audio profile well, every every Heil. mic does yeah yeah so what wh where did you get i mean did you just decide to buy this off the uh, uh off the cuff uh i think i saw it i saw it in a it, you know I, i've seen enough of it in the videos and i'm like let me go online and find out what it is and sure. like, well it's the sure 55 and, and they have a few variations they actually have one that is like has a blue foam instead of red uh, instead of black and i'm like that that looks kind of weird but, huh. um, cool. No. And then I went to Amazon and Amazon has it. And I think it actually, let me see. I think it was actually directly from Amazon. All right. Well, Let's there you go. Here. I am eligible and yeah, no, I'll post a, cool. a link likewise, but, uh, but it's a pretty looking mic. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's really cool that you went out and got yourself a mic. We just got to tune it out. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Just tell me when you do those things. It makes, makes my life easier. Don't feel bad, John. I didn't get a mic at all this morning. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> with this, Pete. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me put my dead horse bat away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do want to thank all of our premium listeners uh, that contributed this week because without you, we couldn't do these things like buy new microphones and um, and all of that. So really, it it makes a huge difference. This week on the biannual twenty five dollar every six month plan. We have uh, Elliot G, we have Kevin S, we have Harry M, we have Michael P, we have David R, we have Tom Tom M, we have James E, we have Paul J, Drew T, Daniel P, William J, and Gray J. Thank you all so, so very much. Really appreciate it. And on the monthly $10 plan, we have Michael P, Bob L, Jeffrey P, Gary B, John V, Stephen A, John D, Santiago M, and Ken from Kailua. Thanks so much to all of you as well. Really, really means a lot and really helps us do what we do here. So thank you so much. Let's get into some questions, shall we? Yeah? Good? Indeed. Okay. Uh, going to Larry here. Larry asks... Quick question. Is there any reason to keep my mobile applications folder on my Mac anymore? It's taking up 14 gigs and there seems to be no need for it anymore. Um, I, my feeling is, yeah, I think you can dump it. The only reason you'd want to keep it is if there's an app in there that you've saved from your phone or downloaded from uh, from the store over, you know, over the years, that's not available anymore in the app store then you can use that to restore the app to your Mac. But 
Um, there's two, re- like other than that, there's really no reason when you set up your phone again, it, you're going to restore from iCloud and it's going to download everything from the store, which is what you want anyway, because the apps on your Mac probably aren't the most updated versions, or at least you don't know if they are because iTunes doesn't do that automatically in an easy way. Right. And, and, and how many times have you had to delete apps recently with the newest version of iOS because they don't work anymore? Because they don't work anymore. Them. That's it's the thing is these old apps yeah. that aren't available in the store they're not going to be likely not going to be compatible with. And they don't even work anyway. They it's don't like, work oh, anyway. So frustrating. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'd say get your 14 gigs back, man. Uh, no question. So, John, do you feel and, differently and, about that? Oh, no. And actually, I, I would say with my recent upgrade, actually, yeah. the iCloud backup. Uh, so the thing is, I was with the guy in the store and he's like, OK, well, you know, we're going to restore your iCloud backup, which, of course, you should always do before you upgrade your phone. <laughs> And I did that. And the thing is, they have in-store Wi-Fi. So it was actually pretty quick. But the thing is, at some point, once it got to the point where it's, you know, you see the little waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to shut the phone down and uh, finish this at home, uh, which worked perfectly. I I was actually amazed because my my past iCloud backup phone upgrade experience was less than pleasant. This one was totally 100% work fine. All my apps were stored perfectly. Cool. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It, I have seen it where sometimes the apps will kind of stop or it'll seem like they've stopped waiting. Usually just kind of makes you realize, oh, it was like updating some other app that it wasn't on the screen and it looked like it had stopped. But tapping on an app uh, will usually will will kind of kickstart that one into gear. So, yeah. And I uh, did that, too. And then I'm like, you know, it looks like. Yeah. So that kind of gives it a nudge. But if you just let it. If you just wait, I mean, it took maybe an hour. Yeah. An yeah. hour and a half. Cool. Uh, all right. Let's see where this one goes. I may regret this. Uh, but Tra- <laughs> Tracy wrote in and uh, and she said, uh, let me find her original message here. She said, I've been using a Synology DS214 Play for three or four years now. Two days ago, I received an alert. Uh, via email from my disk station, letting me know that an IP had been blocked due to multiple login attempts. When I did a Google search on the IP, I was surprised to find a Russian address. I would guess that this was some random attack and probably nothing to worry about. However, I'm wondering what now? Is there anything I should be looking for to see if anyone has actually gained access other than approved users? What security precautions should I take that I may not have automatically been enabled when I did my setup? So this one is a good one because uh, if your Synology or if your disk station detects, uh, I think when you turn on auto block, which is in control panel security account, uh, you can say more than five failed attempts within five minutes and it blocks that IP address from trying again for 24 hours. Um, you can have it, you can actually turn off the expiration on that. I choose to leave mine on and I leave it at at one day. So, you know, hackers have at it. You get five tries a day. Um, I do that just in case I'm traveling and I fat finger that thing, uh, and can't log in. I don't want to be out. my cap locks on. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to be out for, um, you know, for the entirety of my trip or whatever it is. I mean, yeah, I could find another IP to log in from or whatever, but it's just, you know, I'm good this way, but you can decide how you're good. And, and that's, uh, that's how you do that. Other than that, the only thing sort of in a general, uh, sense that I would do is perhaps disabling the admin user, um, on your disk station, uh, or making it so that the admin user can only lock in, log in locally. Uh, so that would be the only thing it, because the, 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 the username of admin, A D M I N. Uh, is common to all disk stations. So if somebody realizes they're hacking at a disk station, guessing the username is easy if they're just guessing admin. So turning that off should, um, you know, then they have to guess both the username and the password. And that just makes it way more difficult. So that, that other than that, I think you're okay. Um, Where was the, uh, so control panel security. Control panel security account. And then. And then it's right there at the top auto block. Yep. Oh, I have mine enabled. Okay. I I think it's enabled by default. Yeah. Yeah. 
I guess I'm I'm not a uh, Russian target at this point. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you're not a Russian <laughs> target, John. <laughs> that you know of. Maybe they're only trying four times a day because they don't want you to be <laughs> hip to them. Ah, uh, yes. All right. Um, moving on to a question from Brother Jay. Brother Jay asks, he says, recently I decided to grant access to select privileged persons con uh, content on my Plex server. However, I did not anticipate the seemingly impossible obstacle of a double NAT scenario that is out of my control. Everything on my setup allows packets to be sent and received. My setup is relatively simple. Coax cable from the wall to a cable modem, Ethernet from the cable modem to his primary Eero node, and his primary Eero node to a secondary and tertiary Eero nodes via Wi-Fi. The Ethernet cable used is the nice, sturdy cable packaged in the Eero box. I also, he says, use private internet access, the sole commercial VPN I would recommend. This is the culprit. My Plex server is fully and readily accessible outside the local area network after private internet access application is exited via the menu status extra where the app's controls reside. I know it is accessible because the Plex control panel reports so upon activation of the retry button. This is reverted after private internet access is re-enabled. I think it's obvious what the issue is. The VPN presents a double NAT scenario. So, and I'm, I'm going to kind of stop right there. So, yeah, when you're running connected to a VPN, either individually from your computer, like Brother Jay is describing here, or if your entire network is connected to a VPN, Inbound traffic must also go through the VPN and I've never been able to make it work where I can actually have inbound requests to a server work when I have a VPN connected, which makes sense that the security of the VPN is built to do just that. So the solution is put your Plex server on a machine that is not behind the VPN and put your other machines either individually, like you have with this one, you know, by installing the client, you can put your other machines on a VPN or you can, um, you know, perhaps set up another proxy server that has a VPN and use that as your gateway for the other machines. It starts getting a little bit um, nutso, but you can and it's totally doable, uh, but you can't have the VPN running on a server machine or at least not on the server process, it would in theory be possible to say connect Plex to the Wi-Fi circuit and not the Ethernet circuit. And then maybe bind Plex to one interface while you bind all the rest of your Internet traffic to another. Uh, I mean, you know, these things are doable, but it, you're it's it's a crazy scenario to create. But um, but that's that's what's going to happen here. So if you are running any servers or services at your house and you decide to connect to an outbound VPN, then your inbound services won't work. And that's just by nature of the fact that your routers now going to or your devices are going to be set to not answer from those things. Does that make sense, John? Kind of. I was mulling this one over in that if you ran your own VPN server versus a third party, would that? Well, I've never you're talking about across an, this. So I'm talking. We're. I think you're. We're talking about two different types of VPNs. You're talking yes. about an inbound VPN server, mm -hmm. and what Brother Jay is talking about is an outbound VPN server. So he doesn't want his ISP to see his traffic, so he connects to a VPN, um, and. And that's where the problem is. So uh, finally, okay, I, I was lost for that entire thing until you just said that. Perfect. Yeah, I'm okay. glad, gotcha. and I'm glad yeah. we got. That's why. I, okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. just trying to figure out why the you know, but I see now why, Two different why you VPNs. said double net. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. It seems to me you could leave your well, then you're someone else. Could, I was going to say you, you leave your Plex server wide open, and if you VPN in and get the data, your ISP can't see it anyway. Correct. But if like you and I share Plex servers right. with each other, right. yours is at your house, right. your, mine's at my house. Um, we rely on the other person's Plex server to be accessible directly from the Internet. Right. So we port forward from our routers or Plex yeah. does it for us yeah. to the Plex server. 
But as soon as that server is now connected to a VPN, all that other traffic you gotta is go ignored. Find, you got to go find the endpoint. And, there, other VPN. and a VPN is yeah. just not going to let you Man, do that. No. Yeah. You're not going to port. You're not going to port forward from your VPN to your house. Right. That's what would need to happen. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yep. I so see the light. Yeah. And, <laughs> and where that gets really frustrating is like, say with the Synology router that I have, right. It can do VPN on the outbound for your entire connection, which is cool. Yeah. The Eros can do that too with the Eero plus service. My Synology router can also be a VPN server. But it cannot do both simultaneously <laughs> because if all traffic outbound is going through an outbound VPN, you cannot have an inbound VPN. It's just it's just how it works. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, a question from last episode where we were talking about 2.4 versus 5 gigahertz. Paul says in episode 696, listener Bob wondered whether mesh would solve his network speed issue. And Mr. Braun observed that his Mac was on his 2.4 gigahertz network while he whilst he was on the throne. I've recently observed this behavior, although not whilst on my throne with my late 2013 MacBook Pro running high Sierra. I have two access points, a base station downstairs and a satellite upstairs on both an Orbi RBK 50 and a Zizel multi X mesh. When connected to the base station, my MacBook Pro will drop to the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi when I move upstairs rather than switch to the five gigahertz Wi-Fi on the much closer satellite. My Microsoft Surface Book switches to the five gigahertz signal uh, of the satellite in the same location. We can rule out the throne in this uh and the mesh system, which leads me to suspect something is awry with the configuration of my MacBook Pro or Apple's implementation of Wi-Fi. I know you guys are router royalty, so <laughs> any help would be much appreciated. So royalty on the throne, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it might have to do with how each of these devices, you know, your MacBook versus the Surface are defining best, right? And we probably should have dug into this more last week. So I'm glad you asked this question. Um, I fear we might've left people with the not necessarily accurate conclusion that five gigahertz is always better than 2.4. That's not true. It's generally up to each device to decide which radio is best. And it might be able to negotiate a faster or more reliable connection over 2.4. And it seems like the, perhaps your Mac is geared to do that at least based on, you know, this anecdotal evidence that we have here. Um, there are some routers that will participate in this decision process. Uh, we call this band steering where the router knows how many other clients are connected to either the 2.4 or bo actually both radio. And it might say, Hey, you know what? That client's not that far away. Let's try that on the five gigahertz. And it'll actually push it over there so that it can free up some space on the 2.4 or whatever that is. Um, but, but there are quality metrics when you're connected to Wi-Fi. You can look, if you hold down the option key, when you hit the Wi-Fi menu in your menu bar, you can see the MCS index. That number indicates essentially the quality of the connection, how, how fast it's able to go. And, um, and, you know, so if your five gigahertz is at say an MCS of like one or two, and your 2.4 gigahertz is up at like 12, maybe that's why it's going to choose 2.4 and getting you a more reliable, effectively faster connection than, um, than you might get over five. So, and it can be due to interference or, you know, whatever. So I think we got that, but what do you think, John or Pete? No, you did because the, I was going to mention the MCS index. And also if you do the same thing that Dave said, uh, and you get that, you know, extended menu, um, it also shows the transmit rate that it's negotiated. Like right now I see on my MacBook Pro, it says 300 megabits per second. Right. Which probably makes sense because it's an 802N and it's right next to the Eero. <laughs> so that's the maximum rate I'm going to get. But yeah, it's uh, the, the, the logic that they use to pick. So higher frequency is better, but you got to mix it with signal strength and, and things like that. And they try to do the best they can to decide, well, you know, is this a time I should maybe change that. Right. Right. And I'll see that sometimes with the uh, debuggy tools or, or something else. It's like, well, you know, I made a decision to change the frequency or the bandwidth because, well, I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Sometimes it's not right. <laughs> yeah. It just decides. That's right. If you really want to control it, the only way to do that is to have 
your networks with different names. So, you know, 2.4 and 5. The problem with that is then you like you have to, yeah, because of the way the, the Mac and uh, actually all Apple products do it. Well, it's just the management disaster. Right. Also, right. Right. It, it is. Yeah, yeah. And with some mesh product products like Eero, you can't change the network names. Like they are always the same. And that really? that is how it shall be. You, no. No. No, the with the Linksys Velop and I think even with the Orbi, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. There's too many user interfaces that I've seen. But I'm I it, with some of them you can do that. And, I, and and with the Amplify, you can do it from Ubiquity for sure. But um but generally but the Eero no. And 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 there's a couple others too. It might be the Orbi is also no on that. Hey, I want to uh, I want to talk about our two sponsors. Is that cool, John? Outstanding. Sweet. Our first sponsor is RoboForm. With RoboForm, you never need to remember or type your passwords again. RoboForm saves all your logins for really easy access, all secure. Uh, we all know we can't use the same password everywhere, right, folks? We know that. I know you know it. I know, and I know you're nodding, but some of you are nodding and wincing <laughs> because you know that you do it. I used to do it too. You need to have different passwords everywhere. And the only way that's feasible is if something is managing your passwords for you, because otherwise you're just going to use very formulaic stuff that's built for the human mind to remember, which also means it's built for the human mind to guess. Roboform takes care of all this for you. It generates stronger, randomized passwords, saves them automatically. You can log into websites with a single click and you can securely share logins, including emergency address, which allows you to create a trusted emergency contact to have access to your data in case something happens to you and you can't give them that at the time. Filling in online forms is simple, Really, really great stuff. They, they've they really done a stellar job with this. I'm blown away with how well this works. Um, one thing I really like is you can set domains equivalents in there where you go in and you say, hey, you know, uh, www.apple.com. I want to have the same logins here that I would at developer.apple.com. And you can like put all that stuff together so that domains that that and and you could even have it like for example uh, you know we used to have iPod Observer right uh, which ran on the same content management system as Mac Observer well I used to have to have two entries in my uh, you know password manager for that well now I don't because I could set the two together really cool stuff the way this works so you got to check it out RoboForms available for Windows Mac iOS Android Chrome OS and Linux. With support for all the major browsers, including Microsoft Edge. Go check it out. Uh, visit RoboForm.com. Download it today. And when you're ready to buy RoboForm everywhere so that you can sync your passwords with all your devices, code MGG saves you 10 bucks. Let's go to RoboForm.com. R-O-B-O-F-O-R-M.com. Download it today. It's free. Download. Use it on one machine. No problem. As soon as you want to go past that, that's when you get RoboForm everywhere. Code MGG saves you 10 bucks. Our thanks to RoboForm for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor is Jamf. As I mentioned, at, it's actually Jamf Now is the name of the product. But if you go to jamf.com slash MGG, you get Jamf management of your first three devices for free, for life, forever. More devices than three, it's two bucks per month per device. But the first three are always free, no matter what. You could have 10, you're only paying for seven. That's just how it goes. So what does Jamf do? Well, you know, it's pretty easy to keep track of your own Mac, your own iPad, your own iPhone, right? You listen to this show, you understand uh, how to tweak things on it and how to do things. And that's great. And you become the one that other people ask for help. That's where it gets interesting because helping somebody remotely can be a little frustrating, especially when that person maybe doesn't understand what you're trying to tell them and does some extra things that can be extra frustrating. Jamf lets you control these things remotely, 
Very, very cool. And you can do it from any device. So you can do things like changing email settings on somebody else's iPhone. Now they need to have given you access to this at first, but you could set this up with anybody that you support. It could be family members. It could be your clients. It could be your customers. It could be your employees, all of that stuff. So check it out. Uh, you can change email settings. Like I said, you can configure Wi-Fi. Uh, you can install applications. You can protect sensitive data. You can even remote wipe a device from anywhere. Really, really cool stuff. So go check it out. Jamf.com, J-A-M-F.com slash M-G-G gets you your first three devices for free forever. I really should say it gets you three devices for free forever, because if you remove one, you can add another one and it's still free because it's just in the first three, you know, and then after the, after you have three, then uh, you pay for what's more, but it's only two bucks a month per device. So check it out on our thanks to Jamf at jmf.com slash MGG for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's, uh, where are we here? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Let's go to James and see if we can get James's question answered. James says, uh, oh, wow, this PDF. is. Oh, no, it's not that much of a mess. It's kind of a mess. Uh, I bought a new Apple Watch, and part of the reason I purchased it was that I could unlock my new iMac with it. Since we don't have Touch ID on the computer, I envision perhaps not only unlocking the computer, but eventually working with a password manager to unlock websites all through the watch. Well, It's been quite a disappointment. Both the watch and the iMac are running all the latest software. I've been online and on the phone with Apple support, including an upper level advisor. And still the problem exists. I have been able, I have been able to get the watch to work for short periods of time, but inevitably when I go back to the system preferences, security and privacy and look at the box to allow my Apple watch to unlock my Mac, the box is no longer checked. And I go through the following rigmarole. For a short time, I'm able to get the watch to unlock the computer, but not long. Once again, when I go back to system preferences, the box is unchecked again. I wonder if there's a corrupted preference file or something that might help with the problem. So, yeah, I think so. I would assume that this preference file is getting overwritten. As long as no one else is remote managing your Mac, which would potentially allow them to change this preference. You want to make sure that's not the case. Um, The first thing I try is rebooting into safe mode. That clears out a lot of stuff. Just the process of of booting into safe mode and getting up and running in that clears out a lot of things. Um, Failing that, I'd try Onyx through its automated maintenance section and its cleanup. Um, You know, and if that doesn't help, uh, John, got an idea? Not really. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not seeing it anywhere. Watch, Is so, it under accessibility? Because I'm uh, not seeing my watch in here, but I know I, I've set my watch up to unlock the Mac, and every time I get in here, it it's opens in right up. it's in security and privacy, privacy yeah. and system preferences, and I'm and, on the privacy tab, and it's right on the general tab. I was on the general. It tab. It would be the yeah. fourth option on the general tab. Apple, your yep. allow, allow your Apple, your Apple watch, watch to unlock your Mac. Your Mac. Yeah. yeah, not every mm-hmm. Mac supports this. I think you have to be later than 2014 to support 2014 or later to support this. If if memory serves. Yeah, it, it uh, yeah, it seems like a corrupt preference file. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Just go delete all your preference files. That's my advice. <laughs> yeah. I tried I tried turning this, you <laughs> know, my trick wrong? is is always to to pull up a search yeah. of recently updated files uh-huh. and then go and check this box yeah. and make, you know, see what file floats to the top. Nothing floated to the top for me, so it might be a hidden preference. Mm. Yeah. But, somebody out there knows. Yeah, somebody out there knows. So if uh if if that doesn't do it, we'll make it a geek challenge. You guys can uh, write in and tell us feedback at macgeekab.com. Because there's Dave, another. I I don't know if I quite heard you. My no, I, I heard you because my headphones are still the same. Okay, that's good. Though if I change them, I wouldn't tell you either. No, I, I wouldn't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you said feedback at macgeekab. That's not what com. I heard. I heard feedback at macgeekab.com. Yeah. Yeah. Feedback at MacGeekab.com. That's the right one. Yeah. That's it. That's it. You can't do that. You broke the rule. No, we're, we're, we're changing the rules, John. You change your you microphone. Oh, I'm changing boy. the rules. <laughs> you said it four times. I know. 
uh, we set it for. There's actually a uh, joke before you're at it. If yeah. if that if he can't solve that watch one, there's another iOS app called Mac ID. That's correct. Somebody and, in the chat room was saying that. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh. I didn't even see that. Yeah, and that's cool. So when your phone gets near your Mac, it will unlock it for you. So I've done that before. I haven't used it. I do have that on my phone, but I haven't used it in ages. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's it's he, it, brother Jay says Mac ID is now known as Uni- Unlocks U N L O X. Oh. Yeah, so we'll put mm. a we'll put a link to that in the. Uh, I still have an app called Mac ID. Let's see what happens when I start. So do I. Uh, still on my phone. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, well, that's why you don't want to delete me. your mobile applications um, folder. Then can you get that back right. in? Here? You want the latest versions of these <laughs> Thank things. Thank you, yeah. brother Jay. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to listener Tim's question here. Tim writes, I know I'll have it. I had it in front of me. Uh, I use and love Little Snitch 4. Recently, he says, I noticed a new behavior for Apple software update processes. While I know that Apple uses CDNs, content delivery networks like Akamai, it looks like Apple is using a server with my ISP for distribution. Have you heard of that? For instance, Little Snitch tells me that software update D connects to Apple servers such as swdist.apple.com and swscan.apple.com and store download D connects to Apple servers such as p 9 buy itunescom and other things. It says the odd thing is that now when my Mac updates software on my home network, I see the download related processes pass off from an Apple server to an IP4 address that does not resolve to any domain. But who is reveals that the IP address is leased from my ISP as an enterprise client. I definitely don't see this address come up when I'm updating software while on my employer's network. Since these are system processes, I assume the pass off is legitimate, but it makes me wonder any thoughts. So this is interesting. Um, it, it's clearly domain hijacking of some sort, but I think it's the good kind. I like. Yeah, it's I, not a bad thing. No. Well, it could be a bad thing. I don't think it is. I I think, it, well, there's there's one of two things that that's happening here, right? And I think it's the first, but I'll say the second anyway. I think it's that Apple and your provider have teamed up to cache these updates. So that it saves general internet bandwidth, right? We do this already with the content uh, cache on uh, Mac OS High Sierra, right? Where you can have a machine on your local network cache updates and that way things just kind of move around and it's great. Uh, There's no reason to think that your ISP wouldn't also be able to do that and wouldn't also want to do that because it saves outbound bandwidth and just keeps all the traffic uh, local to their network. All they have to do is get one person to download, say, Mac OS 10.13.3, and then everybody can get it from the local cache. So that that would make sense. Um, It could be that your provider is sort of doing this on their own. And and I suppose that's possible, but I'm I'm guessing that app, they teamed up with Apple uh, to do it. But but you know the only reason I would the thing is if they were using a CDN like we talked about this, you know, we did this ping tip. And the thing is, if you ping Apple, it'll actually say, and you know, we did this in a, the it'll come up and say, you know, blah blah, um, you know, CDN whatever dot net instead of Apple dot com. So in this case, because it's coming up as an IP address, I'm thinking that they're they don't want to heavily advertise it, but it it, it just leads leads him to believe that they they rolled their own. Well, it, yeah. I, so just because he can't do a reverse lookup on an IP address doesn't mm. mean that a forward lookup wouldn't work. They they are not mm. one in the same, right? So you can create forward lookups with no matching reverse. Uh, so usually you don't, but um, but it is certainly possible uh, to do that. So, yeah, I mean, maybe they're running. Who knows? Maybe they've got a Mac. there running content caching server. I mean, it, I, I would worry about that. They, but yeah. they could uh, go. If you want to do this on your own, go to system preferences, sharing content caching, then hold down the option key and click on advanced options dot dot dot. And you can see that uh, there are some interesting options for clients that allow the scope of things to be expanded. So you could like just use caching server and, you know, put it on a. Big honking Mac and hope for the best, I guess. Well, actually, if you have several of them, several machines on a network with content caching enabled, it will 
I, I think it'll load balance between them too. So maybe, maybe they don't hmm. have to team up with Apple, but I think that's, what's going on here. Um, it, the other thing to check is make sure that you are using your ISPs DNS servers uh, in your router or on your Mac, just to make sure that somebody else isn't like injecting things in there. But I think you're okay. So I think you're all right. Uh, yeah. Nope. Good. Actually, um, a good site to go to. So who is, is a nice tool. Um, yep. There's a site that I think will go beyond that because I think who is, Typically, if you run it from the command line, I think is U.S. only. But um, maybe this is a dated tip that I'm giving here. But if you go to RN, A-R-I-N, which is American Registry of Internet Numbers, .net, when I found a mysterious IP address, I would punch it into these guys. And, and if it's not in the U.S., they'll tell you that. Though maybe who is does that, too. But huh. Yeah, there you go. But I toss that in there. Cool. All right. Yeah, yeah. We'll put, uh, we'll put both of them in the show notes. Never hurts. It never hurts. Um, you want to take us to Andrew, John, or should we go straight to the geek challenges? Um, I think Andrew's good. Go. I think he has some, some good general tips here. So here's what Andrew says. Help. Guys, I've been pursuing this one for a few weeks now with no resolution in sight, and I turn to the Mac Geek App Society for assistance. I have a mid-2011 my iMac in the 27-inch and a 2.7 gigahertz variety running El Capitan 10 to 11, not 6, with 12 gigs of RAM and one terabyte SSD. Uh, I want to see if I can cut some of this out here. Uh, the rig has been chugging along just swimmingly since new, and I've had very few software or hardware hiccups since purchase. Recently, however, my IMAX file association ability has gone off the rails. Otherwise, there have been no new updates or apps that have coincide with this new bug and no virus-infected emails or shady websites that might cause difficulties. I'm well aware of how to change file associations so that double-clicking on any data file will open the application I prefer to use with that data file. For example, double-clicking on a JPEG will cause Preview App to open. I have changed that to open Pixelmator in the past, but currently prefer the default preview. A few weeks ago, double-clicking on the JPEG file inexplicably caused Adobe Illustrator installer <laughs> to start instead of Preview. I wrote it off as a random glitch and corrected the file association for JPEGs, but this kept repeating regardless of how many times I corrected the file association. So I rebuilt the entire launch services database via the following command line. And uh, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> but sure. I'd use something else. Um, I cleaned up the issue for a little while, but then the problem returned. In fact, it started to affect other file types and applications. Clicking on a Word file opens something other than Word. Opening an MP3 opens something other than iTunes. I'm now running the above command line utility daily to correct the launch services. Obviously, I'm not getting to the core problem. I think we can stop there. Sure. You, you, by the way, <laughs> I, uh, you sound fantastic now. I'm really liking this mic for you. I, I, I About you. 10 minutes ago, I tweaked the mid-range uh, EQ just to, to stop it from highlighting that that extra little bit of articulation from you and it I, like it i'm really liking this so let us know what you think folks you already know how to find us but yeah there you go so i answer the question sorry i didn't mean to interrupt. thank you yeah <laughs> i'm i'm glad i made a uh smooth. it's calculated smooth. risk yeah. here yeah yeah yeah. well i read all the probe they were saying you know this mic you know for for <laughs> voice work and i've heard people use this mic and i'm like wow it sounds really good and this is voice work in a sense, right? I mean, I'm definitely. not seen. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely. At least not voice work. currently, yeah. but I may in the future. But um, all right. So something is Andrew. Yeah, Andrew's got a problem. And uh, this may be a, kind of a geek challenge, Dave. But the thing is, I would say that the steps that he took make total sense. Since corruption of the launch services database is often the cause of various woes. One of the most famous, which I'm sure we've all seen at some point, is when you right click on something and go to a contextual menu and say open with you see multiple entries for the same app. That means that what we know as launch services is messed up. Well, how do you fix that? Uh, one of the ways is, uh, of course, to use our pal Onyx, which uh, sounds like he, he, he has, or maybe has not, but if you want to, try it. So it has, um, when you go to the automation and then rebuilding tab, not only is there the launch services database, but there's a few others that I would suggest, Dave. So one is called DYLD's shared cache, which is dynamic loader cache, XPC cache, 
core duet database. One of these must be getting messed up. So using Onyx to clear them out uh, or other means is, is fine. I, I, hats off to using the terminal to rebuild one of these databases. But um, another database you mentioned is SafeBoot. Um, we'll say it before, we'll say it again, but that clears out, uh, I think, these ca same caches. But um, it, it does some other work. Uh, Finally, Dave, uh, what I will recommend, and I verify that it does work. So there is this app that will, if you want to know all the ways you can associate a file extension or the embedded information in a file or whatever, um, RC Default App is the app that will show you all of these mappings because there are a number of ways that Mac OS tries to figure out what app to launch. It's not just the extension. It's not, not just the embedded information. It could be there's like three or four things it uses. Um, and it's usually pretty good, but sometimes it gets screwed up. So I would say that the RC default app will show you the, the low level mappings uh, for several scenarios. And maybe you can use it to detect who is doing this. The, the thing I'm scratching my head over guys is, is it an errant, is the OS screwing up or is it, some mysterious app saying, oh yeah, by the way, change these mappings. Yeah, Please. right. Knock it off, change them. And yep. this terrible thing is happening. I, I've personally never had this happen in that, you know, all my apps are mapped where I want them to. So this could be another geek challenge, Dave. Well, what causes that, you know, what, what is, what is causing, I mean, have you ever run into this? No, <laughs> no, I, it's always worked, but, but I, I mean, I think, I think you're right. Like, where else are you going to go? It's RC default app. Or like you said, use Onyx to rebuild the the shared cache, the DYLD stuff. Yeah. I mean, if it keeps happening, I mean, I think it's a stretch, but, you know, it, I don't know if it's file system corruption. It, it just sounds too specific that it's suggesting an app that's kind of the same, but not really. It, it's putting an app that can also handle that type of file in place of it. And I'm like, well, why are you doing that? I don't know. Uh, I yeah. wonder if an updater is doing I wonder if a software updater is maybe saying, oh yeah, change the mappings, by the way. Just a shot in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it could be, right? It could be. All right. While we're here, we've got some geek challenges. Pete, you started asking us a question and I knew I wouldn't know the answer to it. I'm not convinced there is an answer. I just went down a rat hole before the show began, but. <laughs> right. Yes, and I but, said, but, please stop and let's yeah, do it do during the here. show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here's, here's the thing. As much as I can enjoy Fallout Boy and Panic at the Disco, we start doing the Black Veil Brides and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a little little too much for Pete to listen to. Yeah, you're sounding pretty hip over there. Yeah, right. Yeah. A little too much to listen to all of my 15-year-old daughter's music on the way to school in the morning. So frequently <laughs> I will put my uh, my Bluetooth uh, AirPod in and listen to CNBC or something like that on the way to school. And then she hops out of the car, and if I go to put on the FM radio or something like that, I, I don't know. Call me call me weird. Sometimes I want to multitask and listen to two things at the same time. So I'll listen to the radio, and then I'll go back to listening to CNBC, and I want the same thing to play. The problem is— Remember, folks, he is a trained <laughs> pilot. He's used mm -hmm, to listening mm -hmm. to lots of things, lots of sensory right. input while controlling and, things. Many that, that And I have the Honda with driving assist, so I can take my hands off the wheel and, and watch myself that's die in slow motion. <laughs> that they, that's, I've read the docs. That's, that's not right. what it's for. Don't do that. That's, that's right. right. That's an so, off-label use. <laughs> so the long and the short of it is, however— uh, the Bluetooth, once my daughter disconnects, the Bluetooth in my car takes over the Bluetooth connection to my telephone, and I can no longer listen to it in my earpiece, which drives me nuts. I just want to leave it in my earpiece and maybe even, you know, turn the radio down, and, and it's not having any of it. Um, I think the answer may be to reorder the Bluetooth connection. I, I This morning, I told it to forget the connection and then I put it on again, and now that connection's at the bottom, but my daughter hasn't been in and out of the car since. So I don't know if that's the answer or not, or if there is an answer. Right. You know, is it because there's more power coming from that Bluetooth connection in the car, the hands-free link? Is that going to take priority over my Bluetooth headset that's in my ear? <sighs> 
Anybody know? Anyone? <sighs> Bueller? Yeah, this is definitely a geek challenge. I've fought with this before. We get email from you folks uh, fairly regularly where somebody says, yeah, you know, like my car takes over with this priority, but not that priority or the opposite. Mm -hmm. I can never get my AirPods to, you know, be the first thing on the list on my phone. And, right. you know, I have yeah. to manually choose it. I can go in and manually choose it and it takes it right back within yeah. a couple seconds. And I'm like, oh, this is killing me. And I have a feeling now that I've done that, I probably have to go in now and take all my family's phones out of my car and, and re-add them. Yep. Else they'll get in the car and take priority over, over me. Over you. When, you well, know. yeah, some cars I know have the ability to set like a, a priority level. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen it with music, but I've definitely seen it with phone where you can yeah. set telephone and alternate telephone. So right. the two are connected oh, simultaneously. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Honda doesn't have that option okay. that I've seen. Yeah. Right. Um, I've looked for it, but yeah, yeah, it's, um, I, you know, I've always wondered if it's kind of like Wi-Fi, where, and I could be totally wrong on this folks. So like, <laughs> this is not advice. This is just the, crazed musings of a, a you know mildly hopped up on on flexoril geek um <laughs> the uh it, you know i've wondered if i go and remove everything from the bluetooth pre settings on my phone and then repair all the things is the order in which i add them relevant to the priority that the phone allows them to have right and and if so, which way does it go? Does you know is it first in top of the list or first in bottom of the list? I you know I haven't gone. Sorry, I haven't gone through the pain of removing all my Bluetooth devices and re-adding them. Usually, when I get a new phone, as I'm sure you have now, John, you know when as you encounter each new Bluetooth device. You just like, oh yeah, I got to pair that again. Sure. And so it's some random order. So. I don't actually because I do very little. The the thing that surprises me is that, that and I I heard you going down the right path. So I'm like, can you prioritize this in the Bluetooth uh, system preference on Mac OS? And the answer seems to be no. <laughs> well. And then I tried. I see the devices listed, and I'm like, well, you know, can I, you know, change the order? And it's like, nope. Hmm. Yeah, that makes me yeah. sad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I don't. Right. There's no obvious way yeah. to do it. So whether iOS will let you do it or not, doesn't seem to. Yeah. <gasps> oh, you know. Something just came to mind here. Go. One thing you may want to try there, Pete. Okay. Um, don't let and, my daughter listen to that music. Uh, I, Please I say yes. Wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't go in that direction. <laughs> oh, darn it. Okay. All right. So I got to let her you listen. Gotta, to that. Yeah. You got to let. Right. All right. You got to let your children. Yeah. To find their own path, right? Yeah. Hey, some right. of that's pretty good. But the anyway, you listen to that rock listen? and roll, I think, would be better yeah. instead of this garbage that she's listening yeah. to. No, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, the disco is actually pretty good. But I'm wondering if you could create. It's really good. Uh, yeah. All right. So, so I'm actually going to be doing. So you're going to see something from me about Mac OS server and device management shortly. But I'm thinking. Pete, I wonder if there's a way to use Apple Configurator 2 uh -huh. to kind of tweak the Bluetooth behavior, because it can certainly tweak the Wi-Fi behavior of your iOS device. So I'm wondering if you may want to see if there's something in it. I mean, the tool's free, so. Yeah. But if there's a way to maybe get it, because you, you are able to use it to prioritize your Wi-Fi. As, as we've uh, discussed yeah. in the past. So I'm wondering if it will will allow that additional capability with Bluetooth. Maybe not, but. All right. I got, I got two more geek challenges that I want to throw out oh. here so that we can oh. get the, the hive mind thinking. Uh, the next one is from listener David. He says, is there any way to clear the suggested locations or recent locations in the calendar on Mac OS? Somehow long ago, a letter someone wrote me got into my recent locations list and it messes with my ability to find locations easily. Sorry. <laughs> Are they all right over there, Pete? Yeah. Uh, is it real? It, it is really long and comes up with just about every location I type in. And it's awful looking at this PDF this guy sent. I mean, it's like a five page letter that so comes. Any word in the English language he types in, it, it finds is that in letter. This, yeah. Right. And so it becomes the <laughs> oh, thing. Man. He says, there is no obvious way to do this in the graphical interface, but I'm hoping someone knows where a cache file is so that I can delete this and start the list over. Yeah, I, I don't know where that cache file is. 
I don't use calendar enough to, I use busy Cal instead of calendars. So I, I like don't even, I don't even have a test case to, to test here. So anyway, there you, uh, there you go, John, if you don't, if, if you don't know the answer, we're, we're leaving it a geek challenge, but, uh, but you know, I'm, Oh I'm yeah. Open. yeah oh. Okay. All right. Then it's a geek challenge. The, uh, the, the last one for this week is from JT who has a very simple question that I don't know the answer to. He says, um, a possible geek challenge prior to Mac OS high Sierra, a script was able to be run that put all apps into a nice, neat OCD alphabetical uh, list in Launchpad. And you would do defaults, right? Com.apple.doc, reset Launchpad, bool true, and then kill all doc. And he says, if you run the same script in High Sierra, it will reset the default Mac apps on page one. But a kludge of an order appears for my third party apps. Short of moving them in the order that my OCD brain needs, I'm not sure with APFS this is possible. I've included a link to a website that explains some of these changes. Uh, I'm not convinced that's APFS's fault, but I suppose it could be. I mean, anything could be. But uh, but I yeah, it's Launchpad. It's just Launchpad. Yeah, I think something changed there, and and something changed with the defaults. So. So there you go. I, uh, I throw all those out there and we'll see what, uh, we'll see what happens. But, uh, but that's all I got for this one. So it's time to bring the band in, John. I think anyway, I think it's time. Yeah. To if you're throwing in. out, Dave, I'm throwing it back. Okay. Catch. Uh, yeah, I caught it. I put Just it right back on up. the agenda. That's right. right. No. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, we told you how to find us. What we didn't tell you is if you are a premium subscriber, how you can find us. And that is by emailing premium at MacGeekGab.com. We prioritize all the stuff that comes into that address because you folks help us uh, do what we do. But the goal every week, in addition to learning five things, our goal is to get through all of your questions. And uh, and so that is that is what we do. Uh, and I think last week we did it. We, most weeks we do. It's just like when there's travel or, you know, other interruptions that things just kind of get, you know, just off the list. Uh, cray cray. What's cray that? Cray. It's cray cray. Yeah. Visit us on Facebook. Go to facebook.com. Sla- or, uh, actually, it's easier. Go to macgeekab.com slash Facebook. That'll bring you right there. It's much, much simpler to go that way. Uh, I want to make sure we thank Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get uh, the show from us to you. Of course, I want to thank all of our sponsors because uh, without them, you know, they are part of the, the mix there, too. Uh, obviously, in the show, we had RoboForm, where MGG saves you 10 bucks. We had uh, Smile Software last week. We're at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. You can learn about all the cool things that they do. Uh, we have Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. We have Barebones Software at barebones.com. And then, of course, this week, uh, also Jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash MGG gets you those first three devices for free. That's going to be how it goes, I think, anyway. Hey, Pete. Huh? Huh? What? Hey, how you doing over yeah, there? Yeah, I'm good. I'm here. Good. Durham, New Hampshire, treating you well today? So far, so good. A little chilly, but warming up nicely. Yeah, that's right. Don't yeah. slip on the ice, by the way. Oh, man. That's, that's like the first piece of advice I want to give. Do you have another piece of advice I you do, want to give? I do whatever else you do. Don't get caught. Made up.